We are very happy to be here. It's nice to see everyone. Um, I am Susan Jaffe, the Artistic Director, and before we go into uh, some discussion around crime and punishment, I just wanted to thank a few people who support, foundations who support innovative works for ABT. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Ted and Mary Jo Shen Charitable Gift Fund, the Blavatnik Family Foundation, and the Martin and Tony Sosnoff New Works Fund. So thank you to all of them for uh, helping to create new works. I'm going to do a short introduction to all of our uh, distinguished guests. Helen Pickett, who is a, was a dancer, is a dancer. Once you're a dancer, you're always a dancer. She joined William Forsyth's Ballet Frankfurt in 1987, and she was there until 1998. During her time as a dancer, she also performed a role that piqued her interest in acting. It was a, a piece called Impressing the Czar by Bill Forsyth, and uh, that really got her juices flowing. So she came to New York and joined the Wooster Group, and that really opened her up to all kinds of experiences like choreography and film and acting, et cetera. And her choreographic debut was in 2005 with the Boston Ballet, and she has choreographed over 60 ballets since then. Two, actually three full-length ballets, well, two, two and a half full-length ballets. Uh, first is Camino Real for Atlanta Ballet, the Crucible that for the Scottish Ballet where she and James together, um, Bonus, who I will talk about in a minute, um, won the Herald Angel Award at the Edinburgh Festival in 2019. And they've also collaborated on The Crucible and this uh, Crime and Punishment and the last one before Bovary. Emma, Emma Bovary, Bovary for, the National Ballet. for the National Ballet of Canada. So that's Helen. This is James, James Bonus, trained as an actor at RADA before developing a career as a director with interests ranging from classical theater to contemporary opera to innovation in the use of video design and animation. James also works internationally in dance and enjoys an ongoing collaboration with several choreographers, including Helen. And uh, as I said before, they won this award together uh, at the Edinburgh Festival. And um, James and Helen, also their shared passion for theater and dance makes them remarkably well equipped to be creative partners. And last but not least, Jennifer Tipton, lighting designer. Jennifer has designed for dance. theater and opera over the course of her career. She was the principal lighting designer for Paul Taylor Dance Company, as well as lighting for many productions of American Ballet Theater, where we met many moons ago. She's a multiple award winning lighting designer for Broadway, has earned two Tony Awards, among other prizes, during her 50 years in the theater. Um, and so we're very excited that she is collaborating with the rest of the creative artists on this project, Crime and Punishment. There are a few artists that aren't here today that <clears throat> I will just talk about. The music is being written or has been written by Isabel Waller-Bridge, so it's a brand new commission score. Sets and costumes by Sutra Gilmore and video by Tal Yarden. And so most of this is a female creative team and that was purposeful. And uh, also just want to say that Helen's work is the first piece of choreography by a female choreographer as a full-length ballet for American Ballet Theater. So we're very excited about that. Thank you. So welcome, all of you. Um, I'd like to just start with a question how do you take a huge story like Crime and Punishment and whittle it down into something, a, a ballet, a just under two hours, 
and really distill that story, distill those characters, and figure out how to tell that story. Um, we both have something to say about this, I'm sure, yeah. Um, we start, so this is our, we're working on another piece also, so this is kind of our fourth creation together. So um, something that we fell into right away was we both felt the need to create a treatment or a storyline, write that out, especially for the bigger novels like Emma Bovary, like Crime and Punishment, and to distill what was important, what we needed to tell, to tell a cohesive story also for you, because we're not relying on the fact that perhaps you have not read it or read it, uh, the, the story. So we write this treatment, we make it into two acts. Um, I'm a believer in two acts. And um, it's, it's getting to know the novel so well, first of all, we read it together, and then we have many Zoom calls about how we're going to cut and paste this particular piece of work together? I think this, the process actually begins in many ways with choosing the piece. Absolutely. And, uh, we worked together first on The Crucible, which is not an obvious story to set to dance. Mm. It's quite a wordy play by Mr. Miller. Uh, but it has a kind of clarity of narrative line, which is very strong. And another piece we're working on next year is on uh, Lady Macbeth. And of all Shakespeare's plays, Macbeth has the clearest narrative trajectory. And what appealed to us early on about Crime and Punishment is, although it's a 600-page book, which is a horrendous prospect for a ballet, <laughs> it actually has a very straight line. Yes. Compared to a lot of 19th century novels, it doesn't proliferate sideways, but instead has a very direct contact with the uh, main participant, Raskolnikov, who's a young man on the edge of catastrophic poverty, a brilliant young person mm -hmm. of creativity and murderous impulse. And we follow his story in incredible psychological detail and sort of close-up focus. And that kind of internal exploration of a person, dance is very good at exploring. So that feels like a good starting point and then Helen's in the States or elsewhere, glamorous, and I'm in London on the tube. <laughs> and I've got the book on my phone and I'm sitting on the tube reading the book and I'll highlight bits that strike me. And I go, oh, that's kind of good. And I, and I do it the old highlight it and way. set it aside. And Helen does it with a pen and paper. And we'll come back together a month later and compare the bits that we marked out. And they're bits that either feel really fundamental to a character's journey or feel like they could work well on dance. Helen sometimes goes, there's a duet there, or that feels like a solo. And so we'll come back and compare what the sections were that we pulled out. And interestingly for this one, as I said before, they're very, they were very similar. And so that 600 pages suddenly becomes 200. And then from the 200, we pull out what seem to be the main kind of turning points of story or the main themes. And the main characters yeah. that, that propel Raskolnikov's story. And the last thing I'd say, which is a fundamental to the way we try and create work, is our job is not to explain things to you, but to explore things with you. So we don't try and explain the story, but mm. we explore it in sets. So we explore this young person's experience and the trauma and the terror, terror and the joy. And that's, that's how we start. So how did the two of you, what's your process when you go into a studio? How do you work together when you are in the studio together? I think much like when we work on Zoom, it's, it's very collaborative from the beginning. So where, where we're very similar and why we enjoy um, creating together, and this is a very different thing. So very often, James's role is called a dramaturg, but he's not, he's a director here. We are side by side, which is not common in, in the ballet world. I don't know of another team that creates from the ground up together, and we truly are in the studio together from the beginning. Um, and it's because of all the work we've done previously 
the treatment, all the talks on the phone, how we're focusing this uh, character, how we want to bring this story to you so you enjoy it. Even if you haven't read the book, you're going to follow a story that you see. It will be something understandable. So in the studio, um, we will talk about the scene that we want to do or the scenes in that particular hour or 90 minutes or two hours. I've made a map, if it's a group scene, I've made a map of what I want to do with the group. If it's a smaller scene, like you'll see today with principles, we, in this treat, we take from the treatment, we take that part, that scene, and we both know it so well that I'll go in and I'll start creating characters' identities through their movement. So each character has a movement identity. And, and once I get that down, I can keep asking myself if this is an arbitrary movement I, I've done or if it's a movement that relates to this particular character in this scene. And then he... I think <laughs> people quite often ask me, how do you direct dance? And obviously I can't, because I'm not a choreographer. <laughs> but what I can do, and as a director of actors, or, or opera singers, often a director's job is to direct the space. That we understand story and people's bodies by relationship in space very often. So if you're walking down Fifth Avenue and there's two people about to have an argument, you're, you will naturally, instinctively read the space between them incredibly clearly and understand what's happening. Yeah. And the way that we negotiate space tells a story and so often we're working together in, in those forms as well about how space is working to tell the story. And then also Ellen will provide the choreography and be shaping it and then together we work on the intention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, speaking of space, <laughs> um, so I have had the privilege of seeing some photographs of the sets and the lighting. Uh, last week, our whole production team and uh, Jennifer and actually James was there, you finally um, went there later in the week, were creating the lighting for the sets. And also these sets are really interesting because they, the dancers move them around. So they're these big walls, some of them have staircases and things like that. And so, um, and you have to create a lot of uh, rooms and spaces with lighting. And so I would just love to hear, Jennifer, how do you, you know, take this novel, look at this space, and create the atmosphere around each scene? Yes, well, first the scene was made, was determined by James, pretty much. And then I looked at that shape, at that form, and I made it clear and uh, compositionally, I tried to make it so that the audience would look where they should look and see what they should see rather than searching for it. And um, that was given to me by that information. Dancers in the space will come later because the dancers were not with us. So this was entirely the scenery and the... Uh, transitions between one scene and another. And I may also just say, I just want to back that up by saying every discipline, every person on this team and every discipline, the lighting, the sets, the costumes, we're all telling a story. So this is, an, she, she hinted a bit at it that she focuses the main event really, and but there is stuff happening over here that's also integral to the story. But so we're, it's, it's storytelling from many different sides and that is, that is what a great team does for a full length ballet as well. And one of the things I like about lighting is I can make two stories, the story yeah. of the people on the stage and the story that I like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Jennifer, did you listen to the score at all before you started lighting, Is, or does the music have much to do with that? Well, I try to see as much of the, of the dance as I can, and so I hear the music when I'm watching rehearsals. Um, 
and, and definitely the music is a, a great help, in, certainly in the beginning, that I know how we're going to listen to what we're seeing. Just one thing in praise of Jennifer is that uh, lighting is truly and fully an art form. Yes. And it was very interesting watching you work, Jennifer, because obviously she hadn't encountered the set before, and how it took about 24 hours, and I watched your relationship, you were figuring out how to respond to that space and those elements of design, and it was amazing watching a clarity emerge in the work you did, and I loved watching that, so. Good, and many times I have to go back to the beginning, you know, I spent, there's some time spent trying to find out what we're doing. And then once I find that out, when I get to the end, I say, oh, I forgot, I have to go back to the beginning and make it all the same. It, the, the lighting is quite luminous, and I, I look forward to all of you seeing how it, it just brightens and clarifies the story. Uh, it really makes it so vivid, and I think you're going to get a very visceral, emotional experience, even just looking at the sets and the lighting. Mm -hmm. um, before we ask the dancers to come out, I, one of the things that you have decided to do was make the main character, Raskolnikov, the murderer, Gender, not gender specific, so we have both men and women playing that role, and I would just love to hear a little bit from you both um, about that. Um, Raskolnikov is a character that has many sides. As we know, it's a very complex character. And we, f we felt it, it, it we needed to look at the dancers rather than the gender when we went to cast. And which particular dancers, and ABT is full of amazing dancers as we know, but could, could have the many sides or let's say discover and go into the many sides of this particular character. So it, it became, it did not become about gender, it became about what is, what, what do these, People, how many sides do these particular dancers carry? How much, how much can they express in this kind of rounded way of, of who this character is? Um, yeah, and then you, you, you say something very nicely about the... I think I always <clears throat> was wise. clear that in the theater, from Shakespeare and prior to Shakespeare, almost there's always been a tradition of boys playing ladies, if Rosalind and as you like it, um, and in opera trouser roles, the mezzo role is very often a mezzo soprano is singing mm. a male character, and it's not about dragging up, it's not about changing pronouns, it's about exploring that person through that voice type. And more recently in, in London, certainly, actors like Fiona Shaw has played Richard II or Glenda Jackson played King Lear, and what we're doing when we do that is not saying, oh, now Richard II is a woman. It's going, this person is encountering this person in a creative okay. relationship, and they're bringing themselves to it. And so they're investigating different aspects of that character because of who they are and the life they've had and they bring to it. And so when we work like this with Raskolnikov, it's not that one night in the story Raskolnikov is a woman and no. another night, it's a man. In the story, it's always Raskolnikov. Exactly. But what's happening is that the dancer is bringing their own particular life, the joys they've had, the fears they have, and they're investing those in the character. And I think it, it gets us much closer to the really complex person that Dostoevsky writes. He writes someone, I think, from the start, who embodies conflict and opposition, and also incredible range of dynamic, and it gives you as the audience, or I as the reader, a serious problem, because the man is a murderer, mm -hmm. a brutal, savage murderer, mm -hmm. but he's kind, and he's imaginative, and he's funny, and he's generous, and he's cruel, and he's like a person. 
because we're all all of those things, is the point that Dostoevsky is making, I think. And it's about how do we try to reconcile those things. And that's true for all of us, not just for men or for women. Yeah, and I think it's also a reason why it's, it's, it stood the test of time. You know, Dostoevsky is brilliant in posing these questions about humanity, and he keeps confusing us when we want to put somebody in a box and say this, and then he keeps busting that box open and saying, oh, but it's also this, and it's also this, and it's also this. You know, there are reasons why certain pieces of literature stand the test of time. And it's also it's just what an interesting work of art to go into to try to figure out this person also for us. Well, I would like to bring the dancers out to talk a little bit about their work, uh, bringing out Calvin Royal III and Cassandra Trenary to discuss their roles and the creation, co-creation of their work. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, so tell us, what's it like to really start from scratch uh, and to work with a choreographer, work with a director, and really n knowing, I mean, I know you read the, the book, but knowing very little about how this is going to go and what, what is that like putting yourself into the co-creation of this role? Um, it's... It's a joy, it really is, because I think um, being in a space where you're developing the material and the movement with everybody in the room and with Helen, it's, um, it's very satisfying and you learn a lot about your body and w how you would create a movement vocabulary to um, convey an emotion or uh, say the script, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and it's challenging as well to, to realize that often we're put in spaces where the work is created, you're kind of handed something, and then you have to perfectly execute it the way that you know, it's been conveyed to you. And so it's just very like, well, how does that feel? It doesn't feel good? Shift it. Dancer to dancer, it'll be a little bit different. But the yeah. intention is crystal clear, and that's kind of what is the priority. And that's been really fun to explore. Um, starting from scratch on a new production is always like diving into the unknown um, in good ways, in some ways kind of scary. Um, not having read Crime and Punishment before starting this process, um, I had the few rehearsals that we had with Helen and James um, last, was it last fall? Or, yes, yeah. the workshop was the workshop, the workshop was, was January. January <laughs> seems like last I know, right? <laughs> so much life has happened. Um, but when we first initially started, it was clear to me then that they had done so much research into the story, into the characters, what they wanted to bring out of each one, but also um, wanting to have that dialogue and giving the dancers in the room agency to also, if they didn't know the character specifically at that point share their ideas of what they may want to bring to the choreography or a certain moment in a certain scene. Um, so having that flexibility and, and a bit of agency in the process when it's from scratch is really, um, yeah, it's an exciting journey to kind of dive into. Yeah. Well, I think what I'd like to do is to, we're gonna watch a scene and then Helen and James are gonna work through some of those things in the scene, and then we will watch it again. Um, so let's, let's do that, let's get started. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Wonderful. So, come on, it was really beautiful, everyone. So I want to say, so this is the third time we've done this today. James is going to explain a bit of what happened before in just a second, but I, um, we both approach, but I really see the body, these dancers, <laughs> I don't know where, um, we see space for possibility. So within space of possibility, there's always, there will be always room for the present to take hold more than recreating something again. If some, you know, I've been through it, every performer's been through it. I did a great show, I'm gonna do it like that when you're younger, and, and that's just a losing battle. So, so with the space of possibility that we work with every day in the studio, I've seen three of showings today where they're completely different choices. And I do, my hat is off to all of you because that is the mark of true artists. That's not just a beautiful dancer, that's a remarkable artist. So I just want to say that at the outset. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Great, we'll just get the dancers to introduce themselves to you and they can say which character they're playing and then I can tell you a little bit about <coughs> that scene you just saw. Hi, I'm Joseph Markey and I'm Lucien. Hi, I'm Ingrid Tomes. I am the mother of Ross Kolnikov and of Dunya. Hello, I am Cassandra Trinari and I am Ross Kolnikov. Hi, I'm Christine Shevchenko and I'm Dunya. Hi everyone, I'm Calvin Royal III, and I play the role of Razumikin. Hi, I'm Sammy Park, I'm Sonia, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Great, it's not a test. Put your hand up if you've read the book. <laughs> oh yeah, quite a few. Wow. A well read audience. Beautiful. Anyway, <laughs> what's uh, interesting is this scene doesn't exist in the book. <laughs> Because in the kind of conflation of 600 pages to 200, there's flavors of things that we want to catch. And so sometimes we'll put scenes together. So little things to tell you. So we've got a little family unit here. We've got mum, brother and sister. And Lucian here, if I grab you, Joseph, is engaged to be married to Dunya. So Lucian is a rich man and <laughs> he has very poor taste and is quite unpleasant. And uh, the family don't have a lot of money. They've come to the city. Uh, the, two, the mother and daughter have come to really look after or come and see their son who's studying here. He's not very well. And they've fallen on hard times. And this arranged betrothal's taken place. Lucian is delighted. And he's an extremely unpleasant man. What he does is he puts them in deliberately cheap apartments so that they'll feel humiliated and their humiliation will make them dependent on him. Uh, it's a kind of peculiar type of cruelty. Anyway, so they're in these apartments and he's going, aren't they gorgeous? And it's like a Super 8 motel. <laughs> and they've, they've got no choice but to go, yes, they're lovely. And into this space, uh, Raskolnikov, the, the brother comes and he's bringing with him his best friend, Razmukin, and Sonia, who's a young woman, 17 years old, who is forced into child prostitution. She's got a, eon, a whole line of little brothers and sisters and a father who's an alcoholic and a mother with tuberculosis. So it's a comedy. And <laughs> Sonia is uh, in a terrible state, a desperate state, because she's literally just watched her father be crushed to death in front of her eyes. And so Rasmukin and Raskolnikov, in a kind of panic to try and find some help for her, have brought her to where his mother and his sister are staying. And there Raskolnikov, as you could see, sees Luzin and is, is not happy that he's there. Luzin starts trying to interfere and try to help and a fight breaks out. Raskolnikov leaves, Luzin leaves, and Razmukin and Raskolnikov's the two best friends then get into a, a struggle because this is what happens all the time. He just can't conduct himself mm. in a kind of reasonable manner and he's chucked out, and then Raz Razmukin is left alone with Dunya. And what you're seeing there is the very beginnings of a kind of flowering romance that blossoms across the novel, uh, in a very delicate way, actually. It's beautiful. 
So that's and, what you saw. And I think also his solo is also, mm. that you see here, is also, you know, they've gone through everything together and he tries to help Raskolnikov with his manifesto that he wants to publish and they're really, they're so close and he also feels for his friend that had to leave the university because of lack of funds. So this solo is also a solo like this scene. It's very close to the end of act one. So there's a lot of culmination. It's, uh, Raskolnikov is not just angry about this. He's angry about a lot of things, about injustice, about seeing someone crushed in the street and left, about prostitution. There's a, just a whole lot of seething, you know, injustice, anger. And so this, also the solo is, he just can't believe it. You know, he's flown off the handle again and he just, he, that is also what that solo is. It's his frustration finally because, and I don't really know if we ever see that in that way. And that's also important. We discovered that also in the crucible. We can show things that are not in the book through dance. We can develop this, these, these emotional upheavals that are maybe just uh, hinted at. For example, in the crucible, we saw the affair and it's just spoken about, but we can manifest these things through dance these, and make these relationships and these characters richer because this is the palette we're working with. We're working with so much storytelling, so. You want to work a little bit? Okay. Um, so, Sonia, may I start with you? Now, we're going to have to play the microphone game. Okay. So, um, you asked, so I have this question about her standing back there, but mm. I will, first of all, I want to see, you know this step that you do around your head? Mm. I have a portal mic on, so... I would rip it off. Can you trace your arms? So what, I, what did we say that was? Were you tracing the past? Were you tracing something tender or touch from your mother? Mm -hmm. I want to know what that. Right now I'm doing this. Where should I try? Sorry, you go yeah. ahead. This is, so this is <laughs> yeah. the game. Yeah. So show me the original way. Also, from. Oh. I know, I don't know how to do this either. <laughs> So original way, I'm going like start here. Yeah. To go this way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Try the other. Try the other way. Trace your arm, and when you come around your head, bring bring it more around, like it's a part of. Bring it right around and bring. Have it turn your face exactly. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now it goes into the chenets. Yeah. So show me the pattern. You come out here, knock this arm away. As you knock this arm away, tombe. Come down with your hands, unfold your hands like this is, um, and look right out. Remember, I remember James sa um, saying, make this your focus of something, exactly. Go like that, like a Y. Come up to a tiny little, Pulse pique, pulse pique, lame duck, and then chenet. So it's a bit more of a conversation with yourself as why this is happening. Why? Ga da di da da ba. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Knock it away, yes. Mm hmm. Little pulse back. Yeah. Too many steps, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So here, just pulse back this way. So it's like you're hovering over maybe some, see something here, see why. Uh, see your father crushed in the street. So you go here, he's crushed and lame duck. Okay, that's great too. I don't need the lame duck. Too many things. Hey, that's what it is. You know, you work with the... Yeah, we didn't need the it. lame duck. We didn't need it. <laughs> we didn't need that step. That's beautiful. Okay. I feel like that adds a bit more story before this. Yeah. And then you mentioned something about f the falling. Yeah, it's still just... Because mm -hmm. lots of women fall in ballet. Mm -hmm. And it's nice not to have another falling woman in a ballet. Unless, I mean, it's like, you could just keep playing with it. I, falling I women. 
I think through the Shen is either build to a crescendo, so she goes blah, 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 and fall from frustration, or I don't know, because it's just this thing about women falling over a lot, uh, as happens in classical literature and opera. But it's just, I think, because she's strong, Sonia. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. She is, actually. And she has guts, and she works her way through the world, I think. So I think there's space in there to make a choice about what that fall is. Have it be a moment of anger. Yeah, That's frustration and anger rather than sort of, ooh, I'm feeling a bit dizzy. I'm dropping. I think it's interesting. Somehow, like, I feel like, 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 like Exactly, like, but can you come to, yeah. at the end of the shenay, come to an exclamation mark rather than a... So you're shenaying this way. Hmm. So bring us into your anger this way and then drop. So... Great, that was great. Your anger went through the chenets. It was fantastic. Your anger went through the chenets. Mm -hmm. Give yourself a moment of stop. Mm -hmm. You chenet, chenet, chenet here. Don't come up here. Chenet here. And, and it doesn't have to be tidy. Okay. Can, the stop can be messy. You can go, chenet, I'm in my tennis shoes, so I'd, I'm not going to. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> chenet, and have a moment of stopping and see the death and be angry at it this time and then fall. You're just. Yeah, and I want you to stop. Shene, stop, okay. angry, and fall. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard. Trust yourself. Yeah, that okay, was it. Okay, okay, yeah. You got it. 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 We all know you got it. You got it. <laughs> yeah, be angry about what I'm telling you to do now. Be angry at me. I hate Helen for putting me on the spot. Go ahead. <laughs> Great. Can you feel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean, yeah. Ah. I think I can do more, yeah, but, but like, right yeah. yeah. It's really hard to do separately, you know, like, I will like. Of course it is. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. And, and yeah. you're good. I just had a <laughs> quick general note, everyone. You're doing really well, because this is the third time today. Allow yourself to not know what's going to happen for every person in every beat, in every moment. So Chevy, when you stand up and you go this way at the beginning of the duet, don't know you'll turn around. At the moment you're going this and you know you're gonna do this. I'll be with, um, okay. with, yes. with Calvin. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes. You're just, you know already, I can feel in your body, gotcha. you know you're coming back. She doesn't. And a good example of this was when Calvin drops the chair, neither of you looked. If I'm in a room and someone drops a chair, you go, what? You just would look. True? Yes. So allow yourself to not know. Lose in, have a better day. You're having a great day because you've got this apartment really cheap and they're stuck in it. Yes? So have an even better day so that you've got further to fall when it goes wrong. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. I think just sort of ramp up those things, I think, so push the parameters of that. Hmm. Um, the stuff we worked on the duet earlier, that was great. Uh, there was a moment that you guys found new today. There was even more space that you created within this argument. I think that might be a very uh, important element in all of our decision making. And he, and he inferred it. It's, it is that first time. So there, time needs to be taken to have those moments. And that happened now in this argument. You had a lot of space in there where I really could see the two of you both wrestling with what's going on here for different reasons. You were wrestling, not really what's going on here, you were, but you were wrestling with all the stuff you're wrestling with. And I think just seeing that and seeing the space, when people take the space and the time for the reactions, then it's more palpable for all of us, right? Yes. Great. Thank you. We're literally gonna start this. again. I had one more thing for you two actually, for the duet. <laughs> At the moment, it's lovely. I get two hurt okay. people comforting each other that's really clear, find a, the beginnings of a sense of wonder. Okay. Okay. 
as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, keep hold of that. That you, she's just astonishing to you, and this is a person who's looking at you. I have a question. As all of you. Mm-hmm. Doesn't try and possess you like he does. Right. Does it make sense? Yeah. So find that in it as well, not just two people who are sad comforting each other. There's, a, there's one other thing in, inside it. Okay. And then your entrance, so you're busting in, and it's fantastic. Nice nails. Um, you're busting in. What is this specific, what, what is specifically is that? I, you don't have to answer, I'm saying. We were talking about this the other day, because the original, sorry. <laughs> um, original intention busting into the space was um, carrying over the anger that we yeah. had just experienced. Exactly. Now, as of yesterday, is it? what was today? Saturday, yeah, yesterday, we were talking about it being more, um, the, the energizing feeling that you get when you're like, I'm going to help somebody, I'm going to do something good, and they're going to do it, and we're going to do it, like, welcome to the space. That's what yeah. I want to see more. More of that. Okay. I, I think because I think it's, I think it's like solution-based. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? The first entrance is solution-based. Mm-hmm. And yes, then as it grow, then it can grow into something else. But first of all, like... Like you just said, mm-hmm. all the list, the list, the list, the list. The list. Okay. Yes. If that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can we go again? Fourth and final time. Yes. So. So like it is late in the first act. So I hope that this explanation about where we were. Let's see what it does the second time around.
so much, dancers. Thank you so much. Helen, James, Jennifer. Uh, we will be opening at the Coke Theater on October 16th. We'll be there for three weeks, the last week starting no, uh, October 30th. We will be doing Crime and Punishment. Before that, it's two weeks of rep mixed repertory. So uh, uh, October 30th through November 3rd will be Crime and Punishment. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you.